Hello. Today we're going to start looking at inverse trig functions and, and their derivatives. In this video, we're going to start by looking at the definition of the inverse cosine function. The inverse sine is well described in the textbook in chapter 1. We'll look at the uh, definition of the inverse cosine function and derive its derivatives and look at an example. So the graph of y equals cosine x is shown below. Now as we can see, uh, this graph does not pass the horizontal line test. There are many horizontal lines that intersect the graph in several points. And so this function as it stands does not have an inverse. In cases like this, we use a piece of the graph and define the inverse from that piece. We're looking for a piece that first of all passes the horizontal line test and secondly contains the complete range of, my, of, of the function, that is minus 1 to 1, which are the possible outputs of the cosine function. Now there are many ways to select this piece that meet both requirements A and B. For example, we could choose to save the portion of the graph between 0 and pi, as we see here. So we've darkened that, and then the lightened part indicates we would throw the rest of the graph away. And we can see that this dark portion does satisfy the horizontal line test. Each horizontal line intersects the graph at most one points. Of course, there are other choices. We could save the piece of the graph between pi and 2 pi and throw everything else away. Or you could get very creative and maybe save the piece between minus 3 pi over 2 and minus pi which is shown here, and the piece between minus pi over 2 and 0, which is there. We've also made an open dot at uh, minus 3 pi over 2 so that we don't duplicate points along the x-axis. So even if we draw our horizontal line along the x-axis, we only intersect in one point. The open dot indicates no intersection point here, but one there. So there are many, many ways to save a piece of the function that satisfies these two criteria in A and B. Now, mathematicians and scientists have come to some agreement. And we choose, uh, when, we talk about the in, when we want to talk about the inverse cosine function, to work with the piece of the graph between 0 and pi. Okay. And we can use this piece, then, to define the inverse cosine function. We say. Uh, for a given number b between minus 1 and 1, we can kind of see that here on the graph. Okay. We want to get a value of a for which the cosine is b, and if we move horizontally from b to the graph and then to the axis, we get such a point a. And so we're going to define inverse cosine of b to be a, where first of all a is between 0 and pi, we see here, and the cosine of a is equal to b. I'm going to use the uh, notation cosine with an exponent minus 1b to indicate the, the inverse function. And so again, we want to remember that cosine inverse b, this is the inverse function. This is never to be read or interpreted as 1 over cosine b. So we're definitely not going to do that. Okay. If we want to write 1 over cosine b, we'll always see this written as cosine b quantity to the minus 1 power. So we know that once we have a function that has an inverse, we can find the graph of the inverse by reflecting this piece of the graph in the line y equals x. And we've done that in this uh, next illustration here. So the black graph in this picture is the cosine graph between 0 and pi. And the reflection, given the inverse function, gives us the inverse cosine graph. And we can see by looking at the red graph here, and we can see that it's over the x-axis part between minus 1 and 1. So this illustrates the fact that the domain of the inverse cosine function is all x's between minus 1 and 1. 
And we can see the range by looking at the y values that go along with the graph go between here and here. And that range then, at the inverse cosine function, is the interval from 0 to pi. So as we've seen before, the domain of the inverse is the range of the original function, and the range of the inverse is the domain of the original function. Now we can find the derivative of cosine inverse using the formula at the top of page 77, or 177. We talked about that in a previous video. And this is how the book comes up with some of these inverse trig function derivatives. We can also work with the definition of the inverse function. So let's take a look at y equals cosine inverse of x. And again, we assume we have an x between minus 1 and 1, and the output, the y, is between 0 and pi. So we're going to differentiate, we're going to find dy dx by differentiating this relationship after doing just a little bit of work on this. So uh, we're going to take the cosine of both sides and, and use the definition of the inverse. So if I take cosine of y on the left, and then on the right, we get cosine of cosine inverse. And of course, if you combine a function with the inverse, it just gives you back the original input in that composition. So the cosine of cosine inverse turns out to be x. We'll now use implicit differentiation. We're thinking of y as a function of x. So we differentiate both sides with respect to x because our goal is to find dy dx. So we get d dx of cosine y equals d dx of x. And if we use the chain rule to differentiate cosine of y, remember this is a composition, y is a function of x, we get the derivative of the cosine is minus sine of y and then times what's inside the cosine function, the dy dx. And of course the derivative of x just turns out to be 1. And remember, we want to find dy dx because dy dx will be the derivative of the inverse cosine function. So we solve for that. We have dy dx, just doing the algebra on this last line, turns out to be minus 1 over sine y. Now, to get a derivative in terms of x, we do a little trigonometry. We know that from uh, the relationship sine squared y plus cosine squared equals 1, that we can write the sine of y as plus or minus the square root of 1 minus cosine squared y. And that explains where this root radical comes into the denominator. Why did we make this a, a, a plus in front of the radical? Well, if y is between 0 and pi, Again, we know that from the uh, range of the function. So y is between 0 and pi. And so we know that for such y, the sign is non-negative. And so that means we're going to stick with the plus sign down here. So we can write the sine y as square root of 1 minus cosine squared. And then once again, looking back at previous lines, the cosine of y was equal to x. So we can replace this last expression by square root of 1 minus x squared. So this gives us the derivative, dy dx, the derivative of the inverse cosine function, minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So there we summarize the work we did above. So let's look at an example. Uh, we'll use this in conjunction with some of the other rules we have. Let's look at the derivative of z, where z is defined to be r squared times the cosine inverse of r squared plus 1. So this is a product. So we're going to start by using the product rule. We have the r squared function multiplying the cosine inverse of r squared minus 1. So we've used the product rule down here. We have the derivative of the first function, there's the r squared prime, times the second, which is the inverse cosine. And then we have the first function multiplied by the derivative of the second. 
So r squared is easy to differentiate. This is due with respect to r, so we're going to get 2r for that. And we'll use the uh, chain rule for the derivative of the inverse cosine over here. This is a composition in that inverse cosine piece. It's the inverse cosine composed with the function r squared minus 1. So here is the uh, next line. We've taken the derivatives. So we have the derivative of the r squared coming out to be 2r in front. And then, as we mentioned, to find the derivative of cosine inverse of r squared minus 1, we'll use the chain rule. Think through that. We want to differentiate the outer function first. That's the inverse cosine. And as we saw down here, the inverse cosine differentiates to 1 minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus whatever was inside the cosine function. So there's the different derivative of the outer function here. We get minus 1 over root 1 minus, and now what was inside the inverse cosine function? That was r squared plus 1. And so instead of minus x squared, we see down here, we have minus r squared plus 1, of r squared minus 1 quadrant squared up here. Then we differentiate what's inside the inverse cosine function. That's the r squared minus 1 prime. And then the last line, we've just done a little bit of the calculations. The uh, 2r derivative from r squared minus 1 with the r squared gets a 2r cubed in the numerator, and we've expanded the uh, polynomial expression under the radical.